guys, welcome back to Road 237, and I've got another 1920 silent film. And this is one that I've wanted to see for quite a while. I've had it for some time, just haven't had time to do it yet. And I figure since I'm doing these 20 silent films, it'd be the perfect time to do it. Uh, it's one that's had my interest for quite some time because I really like the uh, star of the film. And he teams up with the director of this one, which he's done before in another one of my favorite silent films. And this is 1924's The Hands of Orlok, which is actually an Austrian film. Stars Conrad Veidt and is directed by uh, Robert Vina, who of course both worked together on The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Probably my favorite film of the 20s. It's either that or Nosferatu. I really can't choose. Which I know in my review of Dr. Caligari, I think I called him Wine. I've heard Wine, Ween, but then I've actually heard that his, uh, his, his actually pronounced Vina, which I would have considered his German, Austrian, you know, probably could have figured out it was Vina. But yeah, I'm going to pronounce it right now. Robert Vina. Um, I don't know if this would be considered a expressionist horror film. Certainly not to the degree of uh, Caligari. But I figured this was going to be, at the very least, a very uh, entrancing and interesting film. And I was right. It does have a very interesting concept. It's a concept that we've seen a bunch of times before in various ways. And I believe this was the first one to do it. And, of course, this is the Kino International release, which almost all of my silent films are Kino releases. Again, I really enjoy these older films that are uh, released by Kino. They do a great job. The only thing that sucks, especially with silent films, is you don't always get the original score. Or even if you get the original score, it's always redone by a, a new composer here um the original composer was a guy named pierre pierre oser i hope i pronounced that right here is a completely different score by paul mercer i've seen clips with the original score and there are pieces in this that really work like towards the climax but then there's other scenes like uh one of the earlier dream sequences that the original score works a lot better but yeah it's a concept that we've seen before and that is Conrad Bite plays Paul Orlock who is uh <clears throat> a very famous uh pianist he gets in a horrific train accident, and his hands are severed, and a doctor transplants the hands of a recently executed killer, and once he finds out whose hands he has, he becomes, you know, it's like his hands have a mind of their own. They want to commit murder or crime. So the whole hands with a mind of their own concept, I think, started with this. I believe this is based on a book. Yeah. By Maurice uh, Renard. And even this film alone has had several remakes, several homages. I do know it was directly remake, uh, remade under Hands of Orlock in 1960 with Mel Ferrer and Christopher Lee and Mad Love in 1935 with Colin Clive and Peter Lorre. It was actually Peter Lorre's first American film. But <clears throat> it also inspired films like Hands of a Stranger in 1962 Beast with Five Fingers, 1946, The Crawling Hand from 63, 
Uh, Oliver Stone's The Hand in 81. There's another one called uh, Le Mans de Roxana from 2012, which is about a female violinist. Uh, the segment in Dr. Terror's House of Horrors with Christopher Lee and uh, Michael Goh, I think was inspired by this. There's a, an episode of Rod Sterling's Night Gallery I think was inspired by this. <clears throat> and I know I've, I've said this throughout probably every review of silent films I've done so far. But this probably is one of my favorite silent films. Especially since this marathon. I mean, it's certainly a horror film. It's This one is definitely more... It is longer. It's 110 minutes. And on top of the wonderful visuals, the great cinematography and direction, it has a very uh, methodical pace. It is a lot slower. It is built more on suspense and tension in this foreboding atmosphere. Really like Conrad Bite's uh, performance. He's definitely up there with Lon Chaney for, you know, I think objectively the best actor, certainly for the genre of the 20s. <clears throat> and, and when you get a very expressionistic uh, director like Vita, you get wonderful, uh, you, know, you you really get to get one, a great atmosphere, but two, some really wonderful shots. This one, it's like Caligari where you have the big open wide shots, but where the expressionism is, I guess this is more tangible than say expressionistic. Like you don't have the odd angled uh, of architecture and stuff like that. So I guess if you get more realistic shots of stuff for like Caligari, it gives it more of like a Kubrick feel. While I know like uh, The Phantom Carriage inspired Kubrick when he did The Shining, maybe beyond just that one specific scene, maybe in tone and atmosphere. But this one definitely had a shining feel to it as well. Especially with that obsession, paranoia, the uh, mental uh, uh, deterioration. Also, like Caligari, the uh, inner titles are done in the font of the title itself. Which I thought that was different and uh, unique. I liked that. Also, when we see like a newspaper article or a letter... It starts off in German and then it crossfades into English. Almost like how if someone, like in a movie where someone can't read or going crazy and they see it written as something different, kind of has that effect. So we see it in both German and English by like how it transforms. <clears throat> I've also said several times that I know silent films are very visual so a lot of the acting is going to be very um, e expressive and animated sometimes over the top and up until this point i've been pretty okay with that but i will say one of the actresses in this which would be um, orlock's wife who was played by alexandra serena which i don't think i have seen her no I haven't I mean she is very over the top in this film I mean the scene where the doctor comes in and says I don't think we can save his hands she has this very long scene of her standing there with her arms out and just kind of before she finally says, you have to save his hands. Or a lot of like laying down and very... I know it's a silent film. They're supposed to be expressive. But I do think she was a little over the top. 
So it starts off with him during his last concert. He's on a train coming home. When she gets to the train station to meet him, she finds out there's been this horrific accident. She gets in a carriage or a car to go there. And I really like how the train, the aftermath of the train accident was filmed. It's at night. You have all this smoke. People looking through the debris with torches. The train really does look messed up. I open shots of just all the carnage. And, and it seems like natural lighting with like the torches or maybe some floodlights or headlights from cars. Really like the look of it. She finds Orlock and is then told he has a skull fracture, which we could fix. His hands, not so much. Finds out that this robber and killer has just been executed, so he takes his hands. And he tells him almost immediately. And the scene after he gets the bandages taken off, there's this wonderful, or a wonderfully shot scene of him in bed. This big open shot. So, like, his bed is, like, here. <clears throat> you know, his bed is, like, down at the bottom corner. And then way up here, we see it looks like forming smoke or, like, a cloud. And then we see the, the face of the killer kind of, like, looking over at him. And then we just see this hand, like, I have done that in every video. I said this during the last one. Hand come down. You know, it's like this, but it's coming down from the top. And it, like, reaches over to him. And he's sleeping, but we can tell that's what he's dreaming. We kind of see his arms go up. Wonderfully shot. I love those big open shots that he does. Or scenes going through an alleyway or a corridor. Because eventually... And shortly after that, he goes out and buys a newspaper. He starts reading about this guy, uh, Vassier. Whose hands he has. And he becomes more and more obsessed and paranoid. He learns that... The killer had this one special dagger with the X on the handle. He finds it in his house. And then he hi hides it in his piano. But Vassier shows up eventually. And Vassier was played by... Um, Fritz Kortner. Which, he didn't really look that familiar. Been in a lot of movies. <laughs> Even before this in 1924. But anyway. <clears throat> he shows up and he kind of takes hold of the Orlok's maid. Like, I need you to do this. Like implied the idea that you know the wife has to go meet with his father and she kind of starts to go crazy wishing not to obey him you know he threatens her with violence <clears throat> it implies that some years have gone by oh and also of course we have the gothic tragedy which is he has these hands that he could use perfectly, but he can't play the piano anymore. And it seems like all he wants, they want to do is kill or do harm. So since he's not making money playing piano, they're now in financial ruin. The uh, they're all all their uh, creditors are demanding their pay. She convinces them to get one more day. She goes to talk to Conrad Veidt's dad, who hates him for some reason. And he's pretty much like, no, screw him. I hate him. She goes and tells him. He goes to meet his father, but when he gets there, his father's been killed with the dagger. And <clears throat> at this point... He's 
finally met. He's met by Vassier, who he has seen in his dreams, and he's seen him around town, but he thinks it's all in his head. And, and throughout the film, he's been getting more and more withdrawn and paranoid and obsessive, worrying his, you know, his wife. So Vassier is like, hey, you know, your <clears throat> father's dead. You're his, you know, main beneficiary. Bring me a million francs here tomorrow. And Orlok's like, why would I do that? And he's like, because I want my hands back. So he undoes his jacket and he shows he has these like black prosthetic hands. Orlok's like, but you were executed. And he shows this scar and he's like, yeah, the doctor that gave you my hands, he did the same thing with my head. So I guess implying he had his head put back on and brought back to life. I guess and that's what they're going with. And he's like, if, but if you don't, your prints are everywhere. Because Vite has also gotten a hold of the police, who the main inspector can just tell the prints are Bassier's by looking to a, a magnifying glass. Those are the killer's prints, and here on the table. So bring me a million francs so I can get my hands back, or I'll tell them everything. Vite decides to go to the police, tell them about you know, his hands and how he... Well, he doesn't tell me he has the killer's hands, but he tells him that the killer Vassier is still at large. And he has a scar around his neck. He mentions the doctor. And this one... Insp we do see the guys talking to right out Paul Orlock on the arrest warrant sheet. Then this other guy's like, no, no, we'll do this. Bring him the money. We'll take care of the rest. And so they get there, <clears throat> and this part of the score, like one, I could tell it was a newer score because they have like these sort of like drum beat that you would see in like a more suspense or thriller type film, but I really like the sound of it. But the dream scene with the giant head in the hand, the original score, I've seen that clip and that score would have worked a lot better. <laughs> So Vite gives him the money, and then that's they come in to arrest him. And then the main inspector is like, oh, this is uh, someone rather uh, Nera, who is like the most accomplished and best crook in the world. And these are actually just like sleeves that he's wearing. He still has his hands and this was makeup <clears throat> and he's like well okay i'm a blackmailer got me but you're looking for a murderer and those aren't those aren't my prints but i'll tell you whose prints they are he tells him them about him of course they believe him so then the maid comes in is like no no it actually is him he was friends with you know the the actual killer and he made these wax casts of his hands and made gloves so he could impose his prints everywhere so they arrest him and invite is like well that means my hands are clean I, you know it was all in my head his wife faints he takes her outside they hug and a movie now i know i went through it kind of quickly <clears throat> and the first half of the movie is a very, again, is very methodical. It is a slow build. It does take its time with, you know, him getting his head. Well, they take his head bandage off immediately, and then his hand bandages off. But even though it implies that years have gone by, like it, it feels like the movie's moving along, but it does go at a very slow pace. And 
oh, what I meant to say when he goes to visit his father, it's a very Transylvanian, gothic-looking castle. But the corridors are like those sort of narrow, kind of teardrop arched doorways, kind of like in Nosferatu. <clears throat> so very like wide shots of him walking through those corridors with those narrow archways. Again, beautiful looking, absolutely beautiful. It is black and white, it's not color tinted. It does have all the cracks and pops in the film, which I absolutely adore. But scenes like the dream sequence and him finding the knife and deciding to hide it. <clears throat> him reading the newspaper about the Vassier killer. It does, it does play out in a way that it is very vague over, okay, is this... Is it a psychological influence? Like, is he obsessing himself about these hands? Or is it supernatural? Like, are these hands really having that mind of their own and control of him? Which, <clears throat> with the pacing and the tone and the atmosphere, I would have minded if that high concept was the case. I do appreciate that they went totally tangible at the end, like a tangible uh, resolution. But I do think it would have been fairly interesting to kind of play on that high concept of, okay, these hands really are cursed or wretched, as he calls them. Or if he was just tweaking himself out and becoming obsessed or his obsession was having that effect on him. I would have really minded it because the movie is so beautifully shot. And I do appreciate the slow pacing. I It takes us... Because it's building its tension. So, and I always appreciate that. One reason why The Shining is my favorite film all, of all time. So I would have minded those outlandish, almost mad scientist kind of... Uh, outcome but then again it is easier to to digest with that completely realistic and tangible ending uh, some other background about the film is when this first came out uh, some the censors like some people I think it was law enforcement wanted the ending to be censored about like the rubber gloves with the fingerprints because they thought it would uh, give people ideas to trick the police. And they thought that was harmful. Of course, it didn't rule in their favor and it wasn't censored out. It didn't even come to America until 1928. Um... I read about the length now because I guess at one point it was played at a speed that made it 92 minutes, then 90 minutes. Oh, there, there is some additional footage in this, which is why it's a little bit longer. But again, yeah, 110 minutes is kind of longer for a silent film. But I, again, I really liked the pacing and just the, the, the tone it was going for. The only thing I would say was while I was watching it, because the scenes with the supposed killer and his maid, they were few and far between and it was kind of distracting. I did, I was thinking at one point that could be cut out. The whole subplot of it. Because that also takes away the fact that maybe this is all in his head. Or it's not just the hands. Of course, when the ending comes in, it makes sense. But before we get to that point, I was thinking that whole subplot can just be taken out. It does kind of take away from the feel that they're going for. 
But with the ending, it does make sense. And again, I have mixed feelings on whether having it be that psychological horror film of, you know, him driving himself crazy or his hands actually being supernatural. But then again, I also do prefer well thought out, tangible uh, uh, resolutions. But Conrad Veidt is always great to see. You know, he's perfect for silent films. He's got those big eyes. And just very... You're good at playing characters that... Well, I mean... In Caligari and Man Who Laughs, his face is all messed up. But you know, he just... He has that perfect look. Especially for someone who's kind of being driven crazy. I will say his wife, yeah, was a little over the top in certain scenes. But I really enjoyed this movie. This felt more like a Shining psychological... Well, a Shining... Shining's a horror film, not a psychological thriller like some people say. Which, no. But as far as films from the 20s go, this is definitely... It feels more... I don't really know how to explain it, but uh, uh, I think uh, Robert Bina did a wonderful job. Again, it's not as far out expressionist as Caligari, but uh, the shots are so beautiful. Those big open shots look great. I I do like the story. It's a very influential story. I mean, I just listed off a bunch of stuff. That were remakes or inspired by it. The performances other than his wife. I would like to see a cut with the original score. Oh, this does come in the trailer for Mad Love with Peter Lorre. But. Yeah, definitely one of my favorite silent films. I mean, the, the team up with Vite and Vina is... Just as good as, say, Todd Browning and Lon Chaney or Wallace Worsley and uh, Lon Chaney. I don't know why this was so hard to explain. At least the, the tone and pacing, like the whole psychological aspect of it. It just, it has that slow burn, foreboding feel to it. And even though there's a lot of wide open shots it does have that claustrophobic almost suffocating kind of vibe to it which is a wonderful contrast as well i really liked hands of orlock even though i just spoiled the whole damn thing uh, you can find it on youtube uh, i would say watch it with both scores but uh yeah really enjoyed it Definitely one of my favorite silent films. Uh, thank you for watching. Oh!